In the first uh, uh, segment of this lecture on jurisdiction and immunities, I spoke about various forms of jurisdiction and I covered in some detail territorial and uh, personality jurisdiction. And now I move to the one that gets, gets so much attention internationally and that is, is more controversial, about which there's a great deal of debate. Uh, and this is universal jurisdiction. Universal jurisdiction remains something that's subject to, I think, a, a considerable degree of controversy. And it's also a subject about that, that we might say generates more heat than light in that there's a great deal of talk about universal jurisdiction and not so much action. Um, so what universal jurisdiction is, is the possibility that a state may prosecute crimes that do not have any uh, link to the, to the state in terms of its territory or, it, or nationality, either of the perpetrator, of the offender, or of the victim. And here the classic, uh, the classic example that's always given is of piracy. Um, it, it, it's, it is an example, uh, courts here in the United Kingdom can exercise jurisdiction over pirates that are brought to the United Kingdom, even if the crimes that they committed were committed on the high seas. And if the, the, there are no nationals of the United Kingdom who are, who are charged, and if the crime was uh, the victims were not nationals of the United Kingdom. We can do it and we would do it. And I'm sure there are examples in British case law of this happening. But the reason there is because piracy is essentially defined as a crime that takes place outside of the territorial jurisdiction of any state. So if you were to go and, and, and charter a, a boat uh, on the Thames, and uh, you were to run up the, uh, the Jolly Roger, the skull and crossbones flag, and uh, get yourself a, a cutlass and a black eye patch and look like a pirate, and then start committing crimes, you wouldn't be prosecuted for piracy because the crime of piracy, if it's committed on the territory of the United Kingdom, doesn't exist. You would be charged with theft, robbery, murder, uh, whatever uh, crime you had committed under the ordinary criminal law of the country. And the fact that you were dressed as a pirate and purported to be a pirate um, wouldn't save you. Um, so it's only if it's committed outside the territory of a state. And that's really simply a practical solution that, um, that was adopted under international law to recognize the, um, uh, that a mechanism had to be created so that pirates didn't escape justice so that they didn't benefit from impunity. And it was premised as well on a degree of international cooperation in that the pirates were an enemy of all states because they were in effect outlaws um, and were, were profiting from that situation. So that's the origin of universal jurisdiction. And over um, the centuries, uh, other crimes were recognized as being subject to exercise of universal jurisdiction even if they can, were committed outside the territory of a state, things like certain forms of trafficking in persons and in drugs and so on. Uh, but more recently, and really the attention about universal jurisdiction in the last, say, 75 years has been devoted to what we might call the atrocity crimes, genocide, war crimes, crimes against humanity. Um, and uh, more and more states have enacted legislation enabling them to prosecute such crimes. Uh, not very long ago, there were press reports of uh, courts in Germany that are, uh, have, have begun an investigation uh, following a complaint from three human rights non-governmental organizations to prosecute the leaders of Syria, but in Germany before German courts. And what's the connection? Well, the connection is not nationality and it's not a territory because they're not, they're not the, victim, the perpetrators and the victims are not German and the territory is not German, but it's the nature of the crime. And what the three uh, human rights NGOs are saying, because of, these, because of the nature of the crime that's charged, whether it's genocide or crimes against humanity or war crimes, uh, that crime is therefore subject to universal jurisdiction and German courts can exercise jurisdiction. And we've had cases in other countries, although some countries have been very resistant to the exercise of universal jurisdiction and haven't enacted such legislation. The United Kingdom is one of them. So the United Kingdom uh, doesn't, has not been as, as uh, ambitious 
as other countries in enacting the appropriate legislation. We've had a very notorious case here in the United Kingdom of uh, several Rwandan mayors who were, um, you know, there's, there's credible evidence that they were involved in genocide in uh, 1994. And uh, about uh, 15 years ago or so, after constant complaints from Rwanda, these mayors who had, had found refuge in the United Kingdom, I think they'd found refugee status, they'd been given refugee status here, Rwanda said, we want them back. Uh, we want them back to put them on trial. And the Crown Prosecution Service, the British government in effect, was favorable to that, uh, wanted to send them back and proceeded with extradition uh, applications. But the courts rejected them um, on the grounds that the, 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 the trials in Rwanda were not fair enough, that there were not sufficient guarantees of fairness, and that therefore it might violate the provisions of the European Convention on Human Rights to send them back to Rwanda. And so they've stayed here and they're free, um, they're free and continue their lives here. And uh, if, if it were another country, the Netherlands, Canada, France, Germany, uh, it would be possible for the country to then prosecute them for its own courts. The country might say it's preferable they be prosecuted in Rwanda, that's where the evidence is and so on, that's where the crime took place. But if you can't send them back there, why not prosecute them in your own country? Um, but they can't be prosecuted in Britain because we don't have legislation uh, that enables um, the courts to do this. And that may partly explain why they chose Britain as their country of, of refuge. So we have people here in the UK who are, um, who are suspected uh, of committing such crimes and we won't extradite them and we won't prosecute, we can't prosecute them because the laws are not sufficient. This issue of universal jurisdiction arose very, very early in the history of the United Nations when the Convention on the Prevention and Punishment of Genocide was being debated. And uh, so that takes us right back to the beginning of the United Nations after the Second World War. And uh, then it was proposed that there should be, that genocide should be recognized as an international crime and one that would be subject to universal jurisdiction. The original draft of the resolution on genocide in the General Assembly of the United Nations made that quite explicit, that, that, that it was not acceptable that certain crimes like piracy were subject to universal ju jurisdiction and more serious crimes like genocide were not. But in the United Nations General Assembly in 1948, when the Genocide Convention was being debated and adopted, uh, uh, the states were not willing to accept uh, universal jurisdiction and provisions that would have recognized universal jurisdiction in the Genocide Convention were, um, were, were rejected. Um, nevertheless, several years later in Israel, uh, a, um, a fugitive, a Nazi, uh, Adolf Eichmann, uh, who had fled to, Venezuela, to, to Argentina after the Second World War and who was essentially kidnapped and brought to Israel and put on trial, he objected and he said, listen, you're prosecuting me under universal jurisdiction. Israel didn't even exist when these crimes were committed and they weren't committed on Israel's territory. And they weren't, the victims weren't Israeli citizens because Israel was, didn't exist in the 1940s. So uh, you can't, and you can't exercise universal jurisdiction because it's not in the genocide convention and it was rejected by the general assembly for inclusion in the genocide convention. But the judges of the Israeli court said, well, it may have been rejected, but it's accepted under customary international law and therefore we'll go ahead. And they did that and they convicted him. He was executed uh, for his crimes. And since then, those decisions have been cited as authority for the existence of jurisdiction, uh, universal jurisdiction over the crime of, of genocide. We've never had a clear decision of the International Court of Justice about the permissibility of exercising universal jurisdiction. Um, in the famous arrest warrant case of 2002, this involved uh, exercise of universal jurisdiction by Belgium over a national of the Democratic Republic of the Congo who had been the minister, he'd been the minister of foreign affairs for inciting genocide. Now, Belgium was never able to hold the trial because the um, the, the suspect, his name was Erodia, remained in the, in the Democratic Republic of the Congo. Uh, 
But the Democratic Republic of the Congo sued Belgium before the um, International Criminal, before the, the International Court of Justice, saying that they had violated inter international law by prosecuting uh, their foreign minister under the principle of universal jurisdiction. And that would have given us a judgment uh, by the International Court of Justice on the subject and probably clarified certain issues under international law. But uh, in the, as the case advanced, Belgium or, or the, the Congo decided not to push the issue of universal jurisdiction and instead to base its case exclusively on the issue of immunity. Belgium or the Congo said, our man is immune from prosecution by the courts of Belgium, regard, regardless of whether it's proper for them to exercise universal jurisdiction. And uh, judges at the court were frustrated because they'd been studying the question and they were looking forward to the chance of making a pronouncement about universal jurisdiction. And so a number of them issued separate opinions, not the judgment, but they issued separate opinions where they regretted the fact that they were not now able to issue a ruling on universal jurisdiction, but they said, we're gonna let you know our opinion. But the problem was their opinions are not identical. And there were some of them who took a very broad approach to universal jurisdiction and said, yeah, no problem, go ahead and exercise it. And others who said, you know, universal jurisdiction, it's pretty much confined to piracy and you can't extend it in the way that Belgium was, was proposing to do it. So th this is just to illustrate the, the controversy about it. Um, we, we don't have, we, it's exercise doesn't happen very often. And so this has not um, given occasion of states to object very often to the exercise of universal jurisdiction. Also because states have um, not always been opposed to the idea that some former dictator in their country was brought to justice in another country. Sometimes they're happy enough that that happens. So all of this leaves uh, to this day some, uh, some doubts about the legality under international law of universal jurisdiction. Um, there's also been uh, a debate recently in the General Assembly provoked by some African countries, no notably Rwanda, who have objected to the exercise of universal jurisdiction in some European countries. And they've called for this to be studied and debated by the United Nations General Assembly. And that has brought out as well um, uh, evidence of the confusion that exists about universal jurisdiction, the fact that some states take actually a very conservative view of the scope of universal jurisdiction. I think that the United Kingdom has made submissions in the course of that debate that essentially uh, limit the notion of universal jurisdiction to um, piracy. So that if a, if, a, if a crime, a war crime, say committed by British soldiers was prosecuted by another state under principles of jurisdiction, maybe the United Kingdom would object and say that they didn't have the jurisdiction to do that. We'll, we'll see if that, if that ever happens. And finally, there's a, a related notion that I just wanna say a few words about. We use the Latin expression, outdatory adjudicari. Outdatory adjudicari means either uh, extradite or prosecute. And this is a, a principle that says that for certain crimes, a state has a responsibility to either send the person back to a state where they can be prosecuted for the crime or ensure that they're prosecuted themselves. And that principle is pr arguably not a general customary law principle, but it's something that we find in certain treaties. So we have the principle in, set out in the torture convention and in the convention on enforced disappearance. Um, but uh, it's not recognized any more broadly than that. And this is of course, not about the possibility of exercising universal jurisdiction, but it's more about the obligation to do so. And uh, we have very, very little practice uh, that would suggest that states consider this to be an obligation. And in fact, we have the contrary. So if there was ever a debate about it, the fact that the British uh, have not prosecuted these Rwandan uh, mayors who are suspected of genocide would be evidence of state practice um, that that indicates a, re or a rejection of a, a sense that there's an obligation to exercise universal jurisdiction in the case of these uh, very serious crimes. So this concludes my discussion of, of jurisdiction and I'm going to proceed in the final segment of this
lecture to talk about immunities.